Energy. Hello, I'm Kendall Bryan Hunter, author of the book Consider My Servant Job, and this is Come Follow Me, Get to the Point, where I always show up, I always come prepared, we never take role, and it's bring your own refreshments. I'm a uh, grown up man, sorry, get the uh, <laughs> having fun with the light down there. Grown up man, I have to still have to buy the uh, jar of honey that looks like a teddy bear, so. Ooh. This is my uh, CPAP machine. So we are hitting a very energetic section of the Book of Acts where it's event after event. We are focusing on Paul. So the shift is away from Peter to Paul. Part of the reason why this is is that Luke, who's writing the Book of Acts, is a traveling companion to Paul. As you read, you'll notice Luke will start saying, we, 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 we. <clears throat> so he's writing in the first person, talking about his, uh, his experiences with uh, Paul, and it just happened that his portion of history survived. We kind of wish we had more accounts, the other acts of the other apostles, but we just don't have those. So this is, we have we have a very Paul-centric version of things. That's not necessarily a bad thing, but it is a bit of a limitation. Paul, we learned that Paul is a tent maker. He speaks Aramaic, Greek, and Hebrew as we read this read this section we also have a physical description of Paul from Joseph Smith and that's in teachings of the prophet Joseph Smith and I will read it to you in case you don't have your copy handy this is from page 180 he's about five feet high very dark hair dark complexion dark skin large Roman nose Paul had Roman citizenship, so that may explain to having why he had uh, a Roman nose, is that he uh, had Roman ancestry. That's the puzzling thing, it's just someone to have Roman citizenship was very unusual. So large Roman nose, uh, sharp face, small black eyes, penetrating as eternity, round shoulders, a whining voice, except when it was elevated, then it almost resembled the roaring of a lion. He has a good order, active and diligent, always employing himself and doing good to his fellow man. Now, it's kind of interesting. That's from Joseph Smith, but we also have a Harvard Theological Review has this article. <clears throat> so I provide the link into it. So it uh, from Harvard Theological Review, published by, it's off the Cambridge site for some reason. This, those Ivy League people, it's it. Uh, so <clears throat> this is what it said, how it describes Paul. As a man of sm smallest stature, with a bald head and crooked legs, and a good state of body and eyebrows, with eyebrows meeting and a nose somewhat hooked, full of friendliness, for now he appeared like a man, and now he had the face of an angel. So it's not identical, but they're kind of similar from this historical record and what Joseph Smith saw. Um, maybe there's something to this whole Joseph Smith thing. So, uh, oh, in case you're curious about early church history, there's a author, his name is Eusebius, and it's a book called Church History. You, you can get a Penguin copy and maybe a public domain copy of it, where it covers sort of what happened in the Middle Ages. Um, things are kind of spotty early on, and there's this, we have this, these early documents, and we have some stuff that happens uh, afterwards, and it's just kind of this weird gap. Hugh Neely described it as when the lights went out, and when they turned on, something different came out with the church. But, um, well, compare that with the uh, Joseph Smith papers where we have very good records, not just from the leaders, but uh, other members keeping contemporary accounts and saving their le uh, saving their uh, letters. This is uh, what we did with the record keeping with the church is absolutely incredible uh, compared to the uh, rising of other religions. So like this, this is a very energetic section of the scripture where we have a uh, cast of thousands, kind of like these old Golden Age of Hollywood, Cecil B. DeMille productions. And uh, as always, read the chapter heading first, second go through and catch all the Joseph Smith translation changes. Then after that, go back and read the chapter and do that in that order and you'll be uh, absolutely enriched. And this is a section where you want to use the maps because what we're doing in the book of Acts is traveling around here in Israel but spending a lot of time in Asia Minor or Turkey and also Greece because this uh, Turkey was actually a Greek colony. That they, they had colonies from Greece on the coast, and so um, it was actually in the sphere of influence of Greece, and not a Muslim sphere as we think of it now. So it functioned a little bit differently than our uh, than we see things today. And these were very uh, the area where 
he traveled. There's a unification coming from Alexander the Great, which is the reason why we have all the New Testament in Greek because of Alexander the Great's influencing uh, and providing a lingua franca to the area. So there's no way to, to do a good get to the point. So I'm just going to rapid fire talk about some of the events that happened in here. And as you read them, uh, try and catch it, catch the things I missed because it's just impossible to cover this all in a then get to the point format. So you have Paul meets this damsel and she has divinization. And she follows the apostles and the leaders around saying, yeah, this is a true church. This is the true church. So Paul finally has to cast the devil out of her. Okay, so why is that a problem? If she's testifying of the church, and well, the problem is it's like getting a Ouija board and asking the Ouija board if the church is true or if the Book of Mormon's true. It's the correct answer, but it comes from the wrong source, and it's an incremental step in going the wrong direction. It's uh, not just the facts, but who's authorized to teach them, and you know, the church isn't just a set of beliefs or principles, kind of like a seven habits seminar. We, you need ordinances, you need a priesthood holders, you need a living authority to keep on top of stuff. And uh, getting it from a uh, someone who's a medium, uh, from a seance, that's not the right place. Um, Paul accused of changing the customs, that becomes a very important thing. You start seeing the church, Christianity, separate itself out from Judaism. So this isn't just a... Uh, you know, you have this sect of Judaism, you, know, you have the conservative, the orthodox, the Hasidic, and you have the uh, the Jesus section that's starting to differentiate, saying, yeah, we're a completely different religion, although we do have the ties to Judaism. And uh, you know what the Book of Mormon says about being nice to the Jews. Uh, Paul gets arrested, and Paul and Silas are in jail, and they sing, and they end up, there, there's an earthquake, and they end up converting the jailer, just like happens in the Book of Mormon. As they're traveling around, they meet a group of people know, uh, in Berea, Call, we call them the Bereans, and they're a good group of people. They receive the word, and they search the scriptures. That's a really good pattern, making sure that you're doing scripture studies so when you're prepared for conference, this isn't a jackrabbit start, that every day if you're reading the scriptures, you're going to be in tune, and you're going to be able to get a different experience from general conference or when you go to church on Sunday as opposed to someone who's just kind of sloughing off and then... Um, at the last, oh, but, oh, oh, it's fascinating here. Put the bowl of cereal, uh, throw the cereal away. Chapter 17, this is an interesting one. Um, this is the, the incident at Mars Hill. This is the first time Christians interact with philosophers. It's very interesting to see what happened and historically what happened later on. So Paul comes to the area, into Athens, and there's a group of the, the uh, Stoics are there, I believe it's the Epicureans, and Luke describes them saying that they just like to tell or hear some new thing. They're a chattering class. They're kind of the, your friends who just like having these uh, bull sessions around and just shooting the breeze. And um, they also mentioned that Paul was bringing in strange gods, and they say Jesus and the resurrection. And that sounds a little bit funny because we wouldn't consider... Uh, consider Jesus a god, but uh, not the resurrection, but it has to do with the way uh, the name of the gods are in Greek, is that um, they have things like uh, one of the uh, gods is Eros, or we call him Cupid, so the god of love, but the word Eros also means love, and their understanding of the Greek word um, Anastasia, which is, uh, that's the Greek word for uh, resurrection is Anastasia, so it's Jesus and Anastasia, so a male and female god, kind of like Baal and Ashtaroth, sort of a cosmic couple. And uh, they're misunderstanding what he's saying, so Paul's there to clear things up. And it describes the Athenians as being superstitious, and that's not quite a good translation. It means they're very religious. They took religion and philosophy seriously, even though it was sometimes a superficial endeavor where people are just chatting. But they took it, uh, they took it seriously, and it was part of their life and very conducive with uh, with Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. That's a good uh, groundwork for it. Plus, the city of Athens is named after the goddess of wisdom, and it was just a very good environment for philosophy. So Paul preaches, and it's interesting because he goes there and he says, Hey, I'm coming up here, and I see this altar with this unknown god. Well, I'm going to preach the unknown god to you. I'm going to uh, clear up your uh, mind that, that uh, who this unknown god is. Then he also quotes poets, uh, Epimenides, Aratus, and Cleanthus, were the, uh, if, if, if my research is correct, is 
the gods or the poets that Paul alludes to, to uh, as he's talking to the uh, Greek philosophers. He talks about how uh, world God's very controls our life, that we're all children of God, and then he starts preaching the resurrection. That's when everything just falls apart. And it had to do with Greek ideas about the body. You can uh, read about this in the uh, Plato's Dialogue. I think it's it's the Phaedo, P-H-A-E-D-O. There's a book called uh, Four Dialogues by Socrates or the Trial and Death of Socrates. I have a copy of it. Oh, no, I don't. I want to dig it out. Where it has a copy of that dialogue where Socrates talks, Plato talks about, through Socrates, talks about his ideas about the afterlife and what happens. And But you just did not have a physical bodily resurrection. And that really bothered the Greeks. So they just did not like the material world. They thought this is some, there's something wrong with it. You need to get rid of it. And then Paul says, hey, we're going to resurrect with a physical body. And it's like, uh, no, so next thing. Now, here's another event is Paul heals with handkerchiefs. Is that he has these handkerchiefs and he hands out and they uh, heal people. That's, that's interesting. Uh, Probably P. Pratt talks about this in this book, Key to the Science of Theology. And uh, what's that? where's that at? Uh, chapter 11 in Key to the Science of Theology. But also in church history, there's it's called the day of god's power and just a lot of people sick so joseph smith went around and he was healing people and but there's more people need to be healed so what he did is he took a handkerchief as his and he gave it to wilford woodruff and said just take this handkerchief um take a handkerchief his was red and then i believe then just rub it on the face of people the way to heal them so it's not exactly how we do healing but joseph smith authorized it and you see the pattern here in the book of acts that you can heal people with uh by rubbing their face with the with the handkerchiefs, and Wilfred Woodruff did it. He was successful, and he kept the handkerchief sort of as a bond or a memento, mem, <clears throat> memento between him and Joseph Smith. So, gifts of the spirit, there's diversities of operations. Do we have the oil, uh, oil and anointing? But also healing people this way was uh, also an appropriate way to do stuff. So what happens? The healing with handkerchief. Another thing is Paul is preaching this very long sermon. It just goes on and on and on. And there's a young boy named Eutychus. He's sitting up in the loft and he just mm, mm, uh, finally nods off. He falls down off the loft and dies. So Paul stops what he does, stops what he's doing, raises Eutychus from the dead, and keeps on preaching. So this is probably the first instance of someone being bored to death. But it's also the ironical thing is that Eutychus' name means good fortune or lucky or fortunate. <laughs> so, yeah, he certainly was by being raised from the dead. So, chapter 20, verse 28, Paul makes a reference to the apostasy. And, uh, yeah, yeah, make sure that's part of, our, part of our messages. There's a restoration because there was an apostasy. So... And we discuss that a little bit later on. So I'm running out of time. So chapter 21, um, Paul goes to the t travels to Jerusalem. Has these funny he gets these funny voyages. He gets shipwrecked later. Shipwrecked later on. He goes to the temple and participating in the Jewish uh, rituals. And that's kind of the problem. We're sort of yeah, we're different, but we're sort of backtracking with things, and we're not quite dividing. We're going to go back there. And he gets accused of polluting the temple by having Gentiles come in. So there's this big riot. And what happens is there's just a lot of chaos. People saying one thing, someone says another thing. And it comes up that Paul speaks Aramaic, which is the common language at the time. He also speaks Greek, because he's writing in Greek. And then he also uh, speaks Hebrew as a Jew, because uh, most of your friends who are really observant Jews would go to yeshiva, so they speak a Hebrew, understand Hebrew. So, yeah very multilingual person. So that's sort of the cliffhanger we leave we leave with this one, chapter 21, and next week we uh, go on to Paul's sermon. So here's the Christ quotient. Ooh, going a little bit over. First of all, how, how vibrant is your spirituality? Because you're getting a vibrant life, that's what happens when, so when you come unto Christ. Your life changes around, you have different priorities. Uh, it becomes very energized as you honor your covenants by um, following Christ. Also, what's your source of spirituality? The arm of flesh? Are you relying upon demons? Uh, evil spirits to influence you? Are you relying upon Christ? If read section 50 about the dangers of uh, evil spirits tempting us in our teaching situations. Section 46 also being seduced by spirits and doctrines of men.
At one point, some of the converts <clears throat> take some of their books and they burn them. So we don't advocate censorship. You know, free speech is paramount. And free speech does not include fraud, libel, slander, or anything like that. It's just this is basic understanding of free speech. But is it time to clean out your bookcase, your DVD case, look at your music? Uh, what things are you watching that are influencing you negatively? Do you need some house cleaning? Uh, are you doing reading stuff that's drawing you to Christ? Another one is, are you studying languages to make your make missionary work a lot easier? That you uh, get called, for, for example, two of my friends from my mission have been called as mission presidents, and primarily because they spoke, they served a mission, they picked up a language, they kept it up, and they were called as mission presidents because they had that. Uh, language ability and that's making uh, that will enable you to do better missionary work even if you don't go to a foreign country for example speaking spanish absolutely one of the most handiest things you can do unless you live in quebec uh, the last mess uh, last point of the christ quotient is um the resurrection that's just what rubs the philosophers the wrong way is the, re the resurrection now things have changed a little bit um thomas aquinas was able to uh take Aristotle and integrate it with Christianity and Christianize Aristotle and Aristotelize Christianity. And we can kind of debate whether that was a good or a bad thing. Um, Eastern Orthodox have a different historical experience than the Western Church. So they're very good people to consult with if you want to get some insight on the question. But are we focusing our message on the resurrection? As important getting as getting forgiveness of sins, resurrection is a greater miracle. And the greatest miracle was what Jesus Christ did, and that is the point.